Hi, I'm Katja Sue from Quantum Design, and it's a pleasure to present this workshop on instruments for quantum materials and technology organized by Quantum Design. Please feel free to type in questions in the Q&A window during the course of the presentation, and we'll try and answer them as they come in. This presentation will also include a live demo in the later part, and I'll provide details uh, in a bit. Quantum Design, based in San Diego, has been well known for several decades for our flagship products used for transport measurements at high magnetic fields and low temperatures, the PPMS and MPMS systems, and more recently, our magneto-optical cryostat, the OptiCool. My colleagues, Randy and Tom, will hold a workshop for these instruments and related ones. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, for these instruments and related ones uh, tomorrow, Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time. So do attend that if you'd like to know more. Apart from the instruments manufactured in-house by us, Quantum Design also has a suite of instruments for quantum materials and quantum optics that are manufactured elsewhere and distributed by us worldwide. In this session, we will focus on a few of these tools, sub-Kelvin cryostats, single photon detectors and counting electronics, optical tweezers for soft matter and cold atom physics, and instruments for quantum education. We'll follow this presentation with a live demo of some of our tools for quantum education. So make sure to stay for that and you can ask questions as you watch the Bell's inequality being tested. Our sub-Kelvin cryostats are manufactured by Qutra, a spin-off from the Technical University of Munich, Germany. These utilize CADR or continuous adiabatic demagnetization refrigeration technology, which is based on the magnetocaloric effect. Qutra CADR systems offer continuous sub-Kelvin cryogen independent cooling, and they're compact and can be modularly expanded. They're ideal for fundamental research, including the testing and pre-characterization of quantum materials and devices. Qutra is the first to offer both single shot as well as continuous ADR cryostats. By combining multiple ADR units, these systems sustain temperatures as low as 300 millikelvin continuously. This process is shown schematically in this graph here with the first ADR unit shuttling between the low temperature stage and the thermal bath while the second unit is connected to the sample stage and provides sub-Kelvin temperatures continuously. This sort of direct magnet, uh, magnetic temperature control without heaters or valves allows extremely precise regulation at low temperatures. And since every ADR system is equipped with thermal switches, you can have heater-assisted temperature ramps from sub-Kelvin to room temperature without the need to warm up the entire system. The absence of circulating gas and cryoliquids allows automation of the system and control via an open source Python-based software. Qutra currently offers three types of cryostats. The S-type Essential, which is a rack-mountable cryostat with a large sample volume and continuous operation at 300 millikelvin. The S-type Optical, a compact sub-Kelvin cryostat with free beam optical access. And the L-type Rapid, a top-loading cryostat for quick low temperature measurements at values as low as 100 millikelvin. The S-type Essential offers a large rectangular sample platform which can support complex setups like detector arrays or other low temperature electronics. In the standard configuration, the S-type Essential has two ADR units allowing continuous cooling at 300 millikelvin and single shot operation down to 100 millikelvin with a holding time exceeding three hours. Additionally, the system features two large user ports for custom wiring like RF lines or optical fibers. Finally, the system is integrated in a modular 19-inch rack with one module containing the cryostat, while another one includes all system electronics, leaving space for additional components too. The S-type optical is based on the same platform as the S-type essential, but instead of a large sample stage inside the vacuum vessel, the system has a cold finger type sample stage pointing outwards from the cryostat's top plate. This allows free beam optical access through several windows with a small working distance to the sample while providing temperatures as low as 800 millikelvin. And at one Kelvin, the holding time exceeds 30 hours. To reduce vibrations, the cryocooler of the S-type optical uses a remote rotary valve, which is mounted on a heavy ground plate. And during operation, the rotary valve can be decoupled from the dewer, thereby reducing vibrations down to the low micrometer regime. While relying on the same technology as the S-type cryostats, Qutra's L-type Rapid features a larger cylindrical vacuum vessel. 
The larger volume allows the integration of up to four magnetic cooling units arranged in a circular pattern. Possibly the most important component of the L-type rapid is a proprietary puck-based top-loading sample exchange mechanism. This allows the transfer of samples automatically to the low temperature stage where the sample is cooled for a minimum temperature uh, to a minimum temperature of 100 millikelvin within less than three hours. And this allows fast and straightforward sample characterization. In the standard configuration, the L-type allows continuous cooling to 300 millikelvin and comes with a sample puck that can support up to 40 DC connections and up to four RF connections. And for the study of magnetic materials, the L-type can be equipped with an op optional uh, five Tesla sample magnet. Our superconducting nanowire single photon detectors or SNSPDs are manufactured by Single Quantum from the Netherlands, a spin-off from TU Delft. Single Quantum uses a closed cycle cryostat which can operate continuously for 10,000 hours or more. First, a bit about the technology and working principle of SNSPDs. You can see this SEM image of a typical SNSPD device. It consists of a nanowire structure fabricated from a thin film superconductor about 10 nanometers thick. The meander nanowire structure typically has a diameter of about 15 microns and is about one millimeter long if stretched. If a single photon impinges on a spot on the nanowire structure, it renders that spot resistive and you can measure a voltage drop across its leads. And so this is how a single photon event translates to an electrical signal. The nanowire is biased at a current just below the critical current of the superconductor. When a single photon is absorbed on the nanowire, it breaks up the Cooper pairs in its vicinity and renders a small region resistive. The supercurrent is then diverted or squeezed around this resistive region or hotspot so the current ends up exceeding the critical current density and eventually breaks up. So the hotspot grows and culminates in a resistive barrier. The change in resistance is large. It's a quantum phase change and easily detected at the leads of the nanowire. After the barrier has been formed, there's a cooling phase and superconductivity is recovered within a few nanoseconds. The system is then ready to detect the next photon event. When the single photon is absorbed, a small voltage pulse of the order of a few millivolts is generated across the SNSPD leads. This signal is electronically amplified to about one volt. Um, and you can see here an oscilloscope trace of a single photon absorption event. In the beginning, the breaking of the superconductivity is rapid. So you have a rise time of a few hundred picoseconds, followed by a decay due to the induction of the nanowire, and that's limited to a time constant of a few nanoseconds. What's the advantage of SNSPDs over conventional detector systems such as APDs and PMTs? High detection efficiency up to 95%. You can customize the detector wavelength to suit your specific needs. Dead times are short. And as a result, you can sustain high count rates in the high megahertz range. There's no after pulsing. SNSPDs are very robust. You can't burn them out. And in some cases, you can have continuous operation of your system as is the case for single quantum instruments. And last, SNSPDs have excellent timing jitters due to their fast response. In fact, one of single quantum standout features is timing jitters as low as 10 picoseconds, the lowest achieved for a commercial system. How do you define timing jitter? It's the variation in the delay between the absorption of the photon and the generation of the corresponding electrical pulse. And to measure this, a pulse laser is used and many of these arrival time differences are measured and plotted in a histogram. Single quantum's choice of nitride-based SNSPD materials leads to the lowest timing jitters in the market. There are two options for timing jitters. The first is with standard amplifiers where you can get timing jitter values of about 35 picoseconds full width half max for 1550 nanometer telecom devices. A typical jitter distribution is shown on the left. But if timing jitter is more important, you can use cryogenic amplifiers to get strikingly lower jitter values as low as 13 picoseconds full width half max. And this is shown on the right. In fact, some of the best case jitter values delivered in a commercial system are actually even lower than 10 picoseconds. Since single quantum continues to um, invest in further research and development of their detector systems, uh, we have some details on some of the innovat innovations that they've been working on, including high count rates, photon number resolution with a single pixel, and multi-mode fiber coupling. Let's go over some details. 
high count rate solutions are based on well investigated technology from single quantum with patent pending. Count rates of a gigahertz can be sustained. Significant engineering efforts have resulted in simultaneously being able to support high efficiency and high count rates. And this graph here shows recent data that demonstrate that there is almost no change in efficiency as you increase the count rate up to 50 megahertz at telecom wavelengths of 1550 nanometers. For more demanding count rate needs, a new technology is developed with patent pending, where you can go well over 100 megahertz count rates without efficiency loss. The plot shows the change in the internal efficiency versus the count rate in megahertz. And the data here stops at 100 megahertz because this was the limit of the measurement setup. However, in the lab, single quantum has synthesized devices that can go up to one gigahertz count rates. Another innovation is a new kind of detection system which provides photon number resolution. This is done with a single pixel, previously thought unachievable. The advantage of a single pixel versus a multi-pixel architecture is that there are no missed photons. In this case, the photon number information comes from the pulse arrival time of the photon event. So this information can be accessed by the use of a standard time correlator. On the right is a schematic of the experimental setup. A picosecond laser pulse is attenuated to a single photon level and connected to a photon number resolving detector. The laser gives a start pulse that goes to the time correlator and the stop pulse comes from the SNSPD output electronics. So you get a plot of the probability of measuring a certain event versus the time difference between the start pulse and the stop pulse. And this can then be plotted on a PC. Measurement data from such an experiment is shown on the right. The blue line is for an average photon density of 0.2 per pulse, and the orange one is for a higher average photon density of 0.7 photons per pulse. And you can see that for a lower photon density, you see a smaller number of peaks at n equal to one and about 60 picoseconds later at n equal to two. If you increase the laser power, you see a broader Poissonian distribution, and you can then see a larger number of photon events up to n equal to three and even n equal to four. The only requirement is that the multiple photons that you want to distinguish must arrive within an arrival time of about 100 picoseconds. Finally, single quantum has also been working on multi-mode fibers since they're easier to couple into from spectrometers, telescopes, or microscopes due to the larger core diameter and the larger number of modes that are supported. A typical speckle pattern is shown on the left. On the right is an efficiency versus bias current curve for a device optimized at 970 nanometers. And you can see that it plateaus nicely with an efficiency as high as 70%. Now this efficiency is lower than the case for a single mode fiber because regular SNSPDs are polarization sensitive and multi-mode fibers scramble that input polarization. But in certain cases, this trade-off is worthwhile since you can couple light into the fiber more efficiently. We'll end this section on SNSPDs with three recent research studies which have used single quantum systems. The first is at a higher wavelength of two microns. Researchers at the University of Eindhoven have grown silicon germanium, which is not optically active into hexagonal nanowire geometries. And the geometry then causes them to behave like direct band gap materials and display photoluminescence at near IR wavelengths. The nanowires were excited uh, with femtosecond lasers at 1030 nanometers, and the time resolved photoluminescence was measured at two microns. The graph on the right uh, shows the evolution of the photoluminescence with temperature. SNSPDs are increasingly being used in entanglement distribution and quantum secure communication. Here, researchers from TU Delft showed that you can get high fidelity between diamond spin and photon entanglement. NV centers in diamond emit at a wavelength where fibers aren't efficient. So their emission is down converted to the telecom band with a, a periodically poled lithium niobate crystal. So they down convert single photons from 630 nanometers to telecom wavelengths of 1550. And they use single quantum SNSPDs for measurements. And last, researchers from Dresden used single quantum SNSPDs with very high efficiencies of greater than 90% at telecom wavelengths to characterize the photoluminescence of defect states in silicon on insulator chips. This work demonstrated the single photon nature of their source and showed it to be very stable with high count rates and that scale with laser power. So this concluded the section on SNSPDs. 
Now the output pulses from the SNSPDs are analyzed and processed using time tagging electronics. Quantum Design distributes such an instrument from a company called QTools from Germany, a spin-off from LMU Munich. QTools is known for their precision distance measurement systems, their quantum education tools, and their precision time taggers. A time tagger is essentially a time to digital converter that takes an analog input and determines the exact time that that input signal crosses a specific voltage threshold. Amongst other tagging applications, time taggers can be used as time correlated single photon counters, TCSPC, which is why they're relevant for SNSPDs. In TCSPC, you take a single start pulse and measure the interval to a stop pulse and calculate the time between the two. You can plot the time interval in a histogram to get its distribution or plot the time correlation between multiple photon events. This sort of processing is used in a range of applications, including quantum optics for quantum communications and single photon emitter characterization, in biology for fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, and in precision ranging with LIDAR or time domain reflectometry, and in particle physics for bunch parity and detector characterization. QTools time taggers are available with a wide range of timing resolution and channels. They have a single start input and between eight and 32 stop inputs. External clock and marker input support, programmable output channels, and logic for functions like coincidences and other filters. Data is transferred through USB 3 so you can have timestamps up to 100 mega counts per second. The system includes software for Windows and Linux, with an easy to use graphical interface, as well as DLLs and examples for LabVIEW and Python. And in the newly developed high resolution versions, you can get timing resolutions down to 2.3 picoseconds for precision applications. Also, multiple units can be connected and synchronized together for a modular approach to increasing channels for a maximum of 360 channels. I'll briefly describe uh, three research efforts that have used time taggers from QTools in ranging, scanning X-ray imaging, and astrometrics. Satellite laser ranging involves reflecting a laser pulse from a satellite for an accurate measurement of position and displacement. In this work from the Matera Laser Ranging Observatory in Italy, a laser with a rep rate of 100 kilohertz, which is an order of magnitude higher than previous work, was used as a signal to increase the accuracy of satellite orbit determination. The return signal was measured using a SPAD detector with a timing jitter of 40 picoseconds, and then processed with a QTools time tagger with one picosecond timing resolution and 10 picoseconds RMS jitter. Time resolved scanning transmission X-ray microscopy allows the study of magnetodynamical processes, such as domains, vortices, uh, spin waves, and skirmions, with sub 100 nanometer spatial resolution and sub nanosecond temporal resolution. The X-ray photons are detected using a, uh, using a phosphor screen enhanced single photon detector whose pulses are processed by time taggers. In this work from the Paul Scherer Institute, a proof of principle measurement was done for spin wave emission from a cobalt ferrite antiferromagnetic microstructure excited by an RF magnetic field. This demonstrated TR X-ray imaging at frequencies above 10 gigahertz and analysis of faster dynamical processes. And finally, this work from Brookhaven National Lab describes improved astrometric precision through the use of quantum, mechan uh, quantum mechanically entangled pairs for two photon interference. And the authors use photons from two different sources that are interfered at two decoupled stations, requiring only a slow classical connection between them. SNSPDs from single quantum are paired with time taggers from QTools with a timing resolution of 6.4 picoseconds. And this approach improved the speed of their high precision astrometric measurements. I will now change track to discuss another instrument, optical tweezers manufactured by Aresis Limited from the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. Aresis specializes in the use of acousto-optic deflectors, or AODs, for beam steering to enable rapid and precision control of optical traps. Time multiplexed optical traps are generated with AODs with trap switch rates as high as 100 kilohertz. Analytical precision for optical traps depends on several factors like trap resolution, uniformity, stability, and accuracy. A quick look at these parameters. 
Aresis has optimized its trap position resolution to within one picometer, well below the trap size. Spatial field non-uniformity from the use of AODs is reduced to below 1% with proprietary flat field compensation. Also, nonlinearity in the angular and RF power response, a notorious problem with AODs, is also eliminated in real time. Trap to trap switch rates as high as 100 kilohertz can be sustained. Trap stability or trap to trap distance can be maintained at as low as 0.05 nanometers per minute. And finally, time multiplexed optical traps often come with non negligible spurious ghost traps. These are eliminated as well. Aresis optical tweezers are well established in the bio and soft matter physics communities, where camera based and QPD based force measurements are often used to characterize material properties. On the upper right, you can see a live video of a cell elasticity measurement where the force versus displacement curve shows the strength of cell adhesion to the microbead as it's pushed and retracted from the cell wall. The force is in the pico-newton range. Very recently, Aresis has adapted its refined AOD-based technology for use in the field of cold atoms. This new Aresis offering, the Cold Atom Laser Manipulator, or COM, is the first turnkey optical tweezer system for cold atom trapping and manipulation and is easily integrated into existing and new cold atom setups. A TCP interface enables easy input of all optical trap operating parameters, allowing integration into the software. And this can greatly reduce the burden of programming for trap manipulation. The video below shows the first COM system implemented in a laboratory, showing the computer guided split and manipulation of seven cold atom clouds, each at one microkelvin. Here's a quick look at a few applications of Eris's optical tweezers. In these publications from different groups at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, you can see a variety of optical tweezer applications in soft matter and biophysics. This work demonstrates electrically tunable low loss whispering gallery mode resonators made of pneumatic liquid crystal droplets in a polymer matrix with tunability approximately two orders of magnitude larger than in solid state micro resonators. Here, researchers studied the viscoelastic properties of homogeneous and inhomogeneous leaven DNA mixtures using optical tweezers and a rotational rheometer. These micro rheology measurements enabled by optical tweezers allows an understanding of local viscoelastic properties as well as aggregate properties in complex mixtures. The graph on the right shows the distinction between the microviscosity of pure leaven versus its microviscosity inside the aggregate shown by vertical lines. In this work, the knotting of microscopic topological defect lines in a chiral pneumatic liquid crystal colloid into knots and links of arbitrary complexity was demonstrated uh, using laser tweezers as a micro manipulation tool. This underscored the importance of topology in soft matter physics. Last, we'd like to discuss our quantum education tools, which uh, will be followed by a live demonstration of them. Our education modules manufactured by QTools can be broadly classified into two categories, quantum information science and quantum materials. There are two quantum information science tools, the QED and the quantum coffer. And the QNV falls in the quantum materials category. The QED produces polarized entangled photon pairs and detects these photons with fiber coupled APD detectors. The system also has electronics and software that enable the detection of the individual photons, as well as their correlation. So experiments such as Bell's inequality can easily be performed. The picture at the bottom shows you how the QED looks. You have the SPDC source, which is enclosed in this white box for laser safety. The entangled photons exit this window at divergent angles. You can see it uh, with the red lines. Um, and they're collected by polarization maintaining fibers. Polarizers are inserted in the beam path to analyze the photons, and the fibers are routed through to APDs, which detect the single photons. The control unit, which controls the diode laser, also uses its electronics to process the APD pulses, 
and plots the result on an interactive touch screen. And you can see the a picture of the touch screen on the upper left. The entangled photons are produced through a spontaneous parametric down conversion process with a crossed BBO crystal scheme. The 405 nanometer pump beam is down converted to 810 nanometers. There are pre and post compensation plates before and after the BBO pair, which are used for temporal and dispersion compensation. Both of these are necessary for making the photons indistinguishable and entangled. The polarization maintaining fibers that accept these photons further aid in the process of making them indistinguishable. On the right, you can see details of the components within the white box that I showed you earlier. The pump diode laser, mirrors to route the beam, a wave plate to adjust the incoming beam's polarization, temporal pre-compensation crystal, the crossed BBO pair, and then a dispersion post-compensation crystal. There is a aperture for alignment and an alignment marker if you need them. The output has a bandpass filter that filters out the pump frequency. So what emerges is very weak entangled photons, which are not hazardous in any way. Uh, there was a lot of design optimization that went into making this source very stable and robust. So you can generate entangled photons at the click of a button. There's no need for time consuming alignment and realignment, which is the case for standard setups built in labs. We've taken the QED to trade shows and it sets up within a few minutes of unpacking and produces single photons almost immediately. The QED is compatible with four add-on modules for additional experiments. The Hongu Mandel, the Hanbury Brown Twist, the Michelson Interferometer, and the Quantum Key Distribution Module. And I'll provide a quick overview and Nico uh, from QTools will follow up with a live demo. The HOM add-on allows a free space region followed by fibers which go to a beam splitter, and the HOM dip gets displayed on the QCR screen. The Michelson module has the standard beam splitter, mirrors, and a movable glass wedge, which is used to vary the path length. With the MI module, you can demonstrate the wave nature of single photons. In the QKD module, you pulse the laser diode in a manner which allows you to produce one single photon per pulse on an average. The QKD module can be used to demonstrate the original manifestation of the BB84 protocol, which uses single photons to explain secure data transmission between Alice and Bob. <clears throat> it also simulates an attack by Eve and countermeasures that can be taken. In the HBT module, an extra beam splitter is added to one arm of a third APD. It can uh, demonstrate the particle nature or indivisibility of photons, and you can uh, use the G2 correlation function to analyze your photon source. You can also combine uh, multiple add-ons, such as the, um, the HOM with the MI or uh, the HBT with the MI to, um, uh, to explore different uh, experimental configurations. Uh, there are many experiments which can be done with the QED and its modules and their combinations. In total, there are tens of fundamental concepts that can be demonstrated and more modules are being planned. Uh, on the left here is a list of distinct experiments that can be done with the QED plus its four add-ons. The QED and its add-ons come in two varieties, manual and motorized. In the motorized version, components like polarizers, wave plates, and path length changes can be done through the motors control through the control unit. So you can use an HTTP protocol to control these components remotely and collect data for remote operation and remote coursework. Uh, keep in mind that an operator is needed at hand to perform certain functions like turning the system on or changing between modules, but the main elements can be controlled remotely and data can be acquired remotely. Nico will demonstrate the motorized version of the setup in a bit. A plug and play version of the QED, which demonstrates the same concepts. The quantum coffer is a super compact kit that has all of this in a suitcase. The source and detectors are under this breadboard that you see in the picture, and light is guided above it with periscopes. And you can have tokens or components like polarizers and wave plates that students can then set up like Lego blocks on the position sensitive breadboard. This is catered more towards school children, museums, and the general audience where QIS concepts can then be studied in a more exploratory manner. The quantum coffer is a more recent offering. Finally, the QNV education kit, which is used for demonstrating concepts in quantum materials. 
The QNV demonstrates quantum sensing using diamond NV centers, a light source and detectors, a microwave sweep field and software to acquire and plot the optically detected magnetic resonance curves. Here are some of the concepts that can be addressed with the QNV and plans are underway to expand this list uh, through a few modifications. I will now pass the baton to my colleague, Nico Klein from QTools, who is live in Munich with the QED entanglement tool, uh, the quantum coffer and the QNB. He will follow with a live demo of some of these tools. Please feel free to ask questions during this demo. We intend for it to be interactive. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to your questions. Nico, over to you. Thank you, Katya, for your very nice presentation. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Nico from QTools, as Katya already said. And um, I'm streaming live from Munich right now. And uh, here in the back, I have uh, set up our QED system. Um, I have set uh, only the basic system right now in the motorized version. Uh, but I also have the add-ons here, and we can maybe have a look at them in a later time. So um, let me maybe begin by giving you a better look and just switching over to another camera. Like this, this is now from a view from the top. Um, you can see on the right, I have the electronic control unit. And on the left, I have the optical part. And um, you can see uh, that I have connected uh, only a laser driver cable to this uh, small little white box where the source is situated. And then also I have the cables for motor control. And uh, on, on this side here, there are the output fibers that are then going back into the uh, APTs in the electronics box. So um, these two, these two uh, things here are the motorized polarizers, um, set one in each of the beam paths. And um, with those, we can perform, uh, like for example, uh, experiments on the entanglement of the photons, on the polarization entanglement, uh, like for example, the Bell's inequality or some correlation curves. And let me just demonstrate that now. Um, so I have, uh, also I can show you the, the screen and uh, uh, yet another camera. <laughs> let me adjust that a little bit here. So on this, on this camera, you can see the two polarizers from the front. And uh, you can now also see the screen of the control unit um, where we now display the active count rates in the moment. So I have everything switched on. Uh, you can see the polarizers are set to a horizontal polarization at the moment, both of them. And we can see that the coincidence counts uh, hit about uh, 1,000 coincidence counts per 100 milliseconds. So we have approximately 10,000 coincidences per second right now. And um, let me just switch the display to this one where we can uh, display a graph of the uh, different count rates. And so the blue one is the, is the count rate in one of the paths, this one. The red one is the single count rate in the other path. And as you can see, the green curve drops in both cases. So this, those are the coincidences between the two arms that we can see right now. And then, of course, when we turn the motors, the count rate will change. And with that, uh, just by recording the count rates, uh, you can uh, just uh, perform the experiments. And in the motorized version, you can, of course, also do that automatically. And we have this uh, application, CHSH inequality tab over here. And uh, by the press of the button, the motors will turn to the 16 different measurement settings that are necessary for uh, calculating the S value in this case. So you can see the motors turning. And um, in the end, uh, the software will calculate the S value and the amount of standard deviations that you are over the classical limit of two for the Bell's inequality. So as you can see now, it's finished. And um, we hit about an S value of 2.67 right now and we violate the, uh, the Bell's inequality by uh, about 65 standard deviations right now. Um, of course, you could perform this experiment also um, remotely and manual. So just as I'm copying the screen to my computer right now, um, you can copy the screen to any computer uh, anywhere with the VNC protocol. And um, then you could, of course, also control that with a mouse. So for example, 
you could uh, access everything that's uh, included in the software on the screen also via the BNC protocol. So I could switch the, the tabs here. I could uh, start the Bells and Equality. Or I could um, also, if you want to have it some, to be some more work for the students, you could also change the motor precision by hand like this. And you're going to see that um, that the motors are changing their positions accordingly when I just set them to another angle via this menu, for example. Um, another remote functionality that is included in the QED is um, that you can uh, use the HTTP protocol to make your own programs, for example. So I'll share the screen of my laptop right now. You can see a very small MATLAB script. And basically, you just need to know the IP address of your uh, QCR, which is connected to the local network over here. And then you can um, use uh, very small wrapper functions uh, like those over here, where you can measure something or go to some uh, angular settings for the motors. And then um, you, can, you can program your own script, like what I did over here is uh, that I used uh, a continuous setting for the one motor and the other I leave untouched. And then I plot the number of coincidences that we measure at the time um, in, a, in a polar plot. So basically, um, what you can see here is the polar plot right now. And um, Basically, when uh, a dot is appearing far from the center, it means we have a high coincidence count rate. And when it appears uh, next to the center, it's a very low coincidence rate. So what does this mean? Basically, I have, as you can see now, I have one motor turning all the time and the other sitting still at the moment. And um, what this means is, uh, you can see the, we, we uh, named this experiment the graphic entanglement, since you can actually see the entanglement here because you have, uh, you can, in one look, you can see the correlations in different bases. So at the moment, I have the, the fixed motor set to, uh, I had it set to 90 degrees, now it's set to zero degrees. And you can see that we have a strong correlation in the, uh, in the straight bases, in the horizontal and vertical bases, since um, uh, the high count rates are now all also appearing at um, the horizontal degrees of freedom for the second motor. And when I turn it to 90 degrees, then the highest count rates will appear when both photons are vertically polarized. But not only that, of course, we can also turn it to a point in between, like for example, 45 degrees. And then we're gonna see, once the picture is updated, we're gonna see that uh, again, this figure of eight that we see in the polar plot has changed direction and the maximum is now at 45 degrees. And of course the same happens for minus 45 degrees. So that is just an example of what you can do with the HTTP protocol. And uh, you can just realize your own ideas with that and make some nice little experiments. And of course also that's uh, working remotely. You just need to have access to uh, one of the ports of the uh, QCR, either via the end protocol or maybe uh, via some port forwarding. So um, that's, that's usually what I uh, would have shown you. Um, so maybe we could make a short break and open for, open for questions right now. Um, See if we can answer some of them. So I see one question about the uh, QMV unit, um, where you have uh, the question is. Can you pulse the microwave sweep field in the QMB unit? And um, the answer is, uh, at the moment, uh, we have only a hardware uh, switch uh, included. So you could pulse the microwave sweep field, but um, you can only do it via an external input of a, of a pulse generator, for example. 
um, and then you would also have to um, you would also have to uh, usually you would you would like to perform some experiment like um, carbon oscillations or something like that and you would also have to uh, connect the pulse generator to the laser and then of course also trigger the photo diet uh, yourself but we're at the moment we're working on improving that and um, probably the mid or end of the year we'll have that uh, we'll have something included in the setup Yeah, I see a question here. Can a magnetic field be applied to samples in an ADR system? I believe this is for the QTRA system where we use a continuous ADR. Maybe Katya, you can answer that one, I guess. Um, right, so a magnetic field uh, can be applied uh, to uh, certainly to the L-type system and, um, and it's up to five Tesla. I see one more uh, question here. Can the AODs in the optical tweezer produce static traps instead of time multiplexed ones? Um, so in the current manifestation, um, this is not enabled at the moment, but it is a future development that is, um, that is being looked into. Yeah, I don't see any more. Maybe we can continue with the demonstration. Yeah, sure. So um, I was just wondering if you could do a poll here. I'm not sure it, it some, sometimes it's possible that we could uh, poll if, if more people would like to see, for example, the home setup of the home dip or maybe the Michelson interferometer. But otherwise, I'll just continue with the, with the home setup. Uh, just continue with the home setup, Nico. Let me stop the script. So when uh, connecting an add-on, uh, you would basically uh, remove the, the weight plate from the small little, little box over here. You can, uh, access that through the small hole that we've made. Since you don't want to have entangled photons for the home experiment, um, but you only want to have uh, photon pairs that are both uh, polarized in the same way. And we can do that by just removing this wave plate. We'll uh, pump only one of the BBO crystal halves and we'll only produce eight polarized photons. And then I'll uh, set the polarizers to H and H, but you could also remove them, of course. And um, as well, I'm going to switch on the laser again. And um, we see now we have a lot more pounds since we don't have to uh, divide our pump power between the two crystals. We can only pump, pump one of them right now. And um, we're going to input all those pounds now into the, um, into the home setup. So let's turn the camera a little bit. I have the HOM setup over here. And um, I'm just disconnecting the fibers from the control unit. I'm going to connect them to the inputs of the HOM system. Um, when you do that, please remember the inputs are labeled because uh, the fiber lengths, of course, differ a little bit. And for the home setup, the two photons that we produce, they have to impinge on the beams that are at exactly the same time for the interference to be visible. So. I match the QED output 2 to the home out input 2, and I match the QED output 1 with the home output 1. And um, when you do that, then the interference should happen somewhere around a small mark that we at QTools um, put onto the board over here, where you have a, a linear translation stage, which is motorized in this case, 
and um, one of the input photons is going to be coupled out of the fiber over here, and one of them is coupled out of the fiber over here, and both of them will go through a free space line over to the other side, where they are coupled into fibers again, and then land onto a fiber coupled uh, beam splitter, which sits in the middle over here, and from this one, I have to connect the outputs of the home setup now back into the drone unit so we can actually uh, detect the photons. I just do that now. So I'll also stream the screen again. Over there. So you can see that we already have a signal. And maybe we can optimize it a little bit by turning on the screws, but it should be pretty good right now. Okay, all right. So I'll now just deactivate the signal count rates since uh, those are not very interesting for the HOM setup. And uh, for the beginning, um, I will do a very coarse search just by um, turning the motor by hand. Also disconnected for that, since as a stepping motor it has a holding current, and I don't want to mess with that right now. And I'm just turning it by hand and carefully observe the coincidences that we see. And go slowly over the mark that we that we made at Qtools. And as you can see, when I go over this mark, you can see a drop in the coincidence to operate. And this is already the, the home magnetic. So I remember uh, in which direction the motor has to turn now. Goes clockwise. Over the dip and then reconnect the motor. And then in the uh, linear scanning tab over here, I can uh, set some scanning parameters like step size and the target, and also an integration time. And I just do a quick scan and press start. And of course, I chose the wrong direction. <laughs> so let me do that again and press start. And then uh, the motor will turn and um, in very small steps. And then we should be able to see the monthly interference in a little better way than as with the, with the manual turning of the motor. So there it is. The display rescales as new counts come in. And then the coincidence count rate rises again. And that's the whole month of dip. And let me maybe also show you. Oops. Let me also show you what happens when we um, now connect the, the uh, HPT add-on as well. So for example, you could now show that, um, I mean, the home model interference maybe is an effect where uh, the two photons that impinge at the beam filter at the same time interfere in a way that they always leave the beam filter together. So you're never gonna, that's why the, the coincidence count rate drops since we're not seeing the uh, two photons in different outputs of the beam splitter anymore. So that means that in one of the outputs, we should always have two photons now. Um, we can test that by introducing a beam splitter in, the, in one of the outputs and connecting that to the third detector as well. So to the second and the third, and then watching for coincidences between uh, those two outputs, which should theoretically rise when, um, we are at the side of the home monitor. So let me put them in. Like that. And um, I'll press start here again. Let me do something first.
So now in, in green, you see the coincidences that we uh, saw before. In uh, lilac, you'll see the coincidences between uh, the trigger, so the one output that is not connected to the HPT beam splitter. And in gray, you'll see the, the coincidences between the two outputs of the uh, HPT beam splitter that we just connected. And as you can see, there's a dip in the two, uh, in the two colorful uh, count rates. And uh, there's actually a rise in the uh, two photon uh, events uh, behind the HPT beam splitter. So that's uh, an experiment you could do with a combination of add-ons. So I have another question here. What's the rate of entangled pair generation? Um, so that's a little bit, uh, so entangled pairs, okay. We can maybe check that as well. Let me just um, go back to the configuration and set that to 100 again. So the entangled pairs, I have to put in the quick click again. Well, I'll have to disconnect the add-on now, so, so let me just answer the question. Um, usually we have about, um, so before we had about 10,000 per second, um, which were only in one basis. So we have uh, actual entangled photon pairs detected at about 20,000 per second in this case. Um, but this is a very good setup, so usually we are a bit lower, and we specify actually only about uh, three to 5,000. Usually you have more than that, um, but uh, it's seldom that you're gonna reach 20,000 per second. Are there any more questions? Um, I'm not seeing any. I think we're... Um... Do you have any other quick um, uh, demos for, let's say, the quantum coffer? We have maybe two or three minutes. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the quantum coffer here actually right now. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, that's all right. So, I cannot show that, unfortunately. Um, no worries. I think, um, I think this, this was an excellent demo. Thank you very much, Nico. And, of course. Um, um, Thank you. If you have additional questions, uh, you can write to us at uh, qdusa.com. And uh, please do visit, the, uh, visit our booth, Quantum Design booth at the APS, and you'll find uh, more information on all of these um, instruments that we talked about today. Thank you for also, your attention. Also, if you're uh, interested in the quantum coffer, since I'm not having it here, um, you could have a look at our YouTube channel. So just type in QTools. Um, at YouTube and you're going to find us and you're finding some videos on the quantum coffer and a few on the QN there as well. So. Right. Uh, and you'll also find them on the quantum design webpage. So um, uh, do visit our booth. Thank you for your attention and, uh, and have a good day.